The show opens up as a man named Michael wakes up in the desert feeling disoriented and uncertain of his location. Suddenly, he hears the sound of a gunshot and barking dogs. Looking up, he witnesses a group of armed men chasing an elderly man. Determined to help, Michael rushes towards the old man and carries him to a nearby cave. Sadly, the old man has also been shot and, with his last breath, he asks Michael to conceal his body and inform someone named 554 that he managed to escape. Although Michael doesn't comprehend the meaning behind the request, he proceeds to bury the body before embarking on his unknown journey. After walking for some time, Michael arrives in an unnamed village and hails a taxi, requesting to be taken to a train station. However, the driver named 147 appears confused and explains that his services are limited to local destinations. Unable to grasp the situation, Michael abruptly exits the moving cab and enters a crowded nightclub. There, he approaches a woman and seeks her assistance. But before they can engage in further conversation, the sound of barking dogs startles Michael, prompting him to flee. Outside, he coincidentally runs into the same cab, and this time, Michael instructs driver 147 to take him to 554. Surprisingly, the driver understands this and takes him to a young waitress at the Solar Cafe. Upon entering, Michael follows the old man's instructions and informs the waitress that he has successfully escaped. In response, the waitress identifies the old man as 93, but hesitates to disclose any additional information as she wishes to avoid involvement in any potential trouble. Suddenly, the armed pursuers and barking dogs reappear, prompting Michael to run upstairs. With no other means of escape, he breaks a window and jumps onto a ledge. At that moment, he notices a man wearing a hat, casually tossing an object in his hand. The next second, Michael suddenly loses consciousness and falls from the ledge. After some time, he wakes up in the village hospital and discovers that the doctor treating him is none other than the woman he encountered at the nightclub, referred to as Dr. 313. Curious about his situation, Michael inquires about what's happening and she advises him to accept the reality around him. Before being discharged, Michael is brought to meet the same enigmatic man wearing a hat. His name is Two and he seems to be the one who controls the village. Michael demands that he be taken to the American Consul, which can transport him back to New York. York. However, Two, who addresses Michael as Six, informs him that New York doesn't exist. Following this, Michael is driven to an apartment labeled Number Six, which bears a striking resemblance to his apartment in New York. The next day, while wandering through the streets of the village, Michael notices two prominent towers in the distance. Driven by his determination to find an escape, he purchases a map from a local shopkeeper, steals a cab, and ventures out into the desert. He then climbs up to the highest point of a rock formation and searches for an escape route, but doesn't find any. Overwhelmed by fatigue, Michael collapses on the ground. After a while, 313 discovers him in the desert and takes him back to the village in her car. The following day, Michael visits the old man 93's apartment in search of clues. Inside, he discovers a drawing depicting Big Ben in London. Michael then seeks an explanation about the drawing from 554. Initially hesitant, 554 reveals to him about 93's dreams regarding another world. 93 believed that they were prisoners being held in the village. Furthermore, 554 asserts that there are others who also experience these dreams and proceeds to share her own drawing, a recurring vision featuring the statue of Liberty. This revelation ignites hope within Michael, and he assures 554 that they'll work together to find a way out of the village. Michael has drawings too, many drawings of McDonald's, but he keeps them a secret for now. On the following morning, Michael awakens to the sound of the final rites for 93. Hurriedly, he steps outside and informs the mourners that there exists another place beyond the village, and that 93 had discovered a way out. However, Two dismisses his claims and proceeds with the final ritual. After this, this, Michael heads towards the Solar Cafe in search of 554. While outside the cafe, he notices an unidentified man listening to news of a gas explosion. Shortly after, a devastating explosion rocks the cafe, resulting in numerous deaths. Frantically searching for 554, Michael finds her on the brink of death. In her final moments, she instructs him to follow the towers. In the aftermath of this tragedy, Michael regains consciousness in the desert, where he had been lying unconscious. The sight of a seagull triggers a childhood memory of a beach trip with his brother. At that moment, a man named Sixteen awakens him and escorts him back to the village. They visit Two, who insists that Sixteen is Michael's brother. Despite Michael's denial, Sixteen presents a childhood photograph as evidence of their connection. Confused and unable to comprehend the situation, Michael gets angry and accuses Two of trying to manipulate his mind. In the next scene, Sixteen takes Michael to his home, where his children joyfully welcome him. They call Michael Uncle Six, stealing Drake's nickname. 
Bold, Sixteen's wife then prepares Michael's favorite meal, and the family enjoys an episode of a soap opera called Wonkers set in the village. Later, in a private conversation, Sixteen manages to persuade Michael to consider attending therapy sessions. Meanwhile, too, in his mansion, tending to his bedridden wife, he administers three different colored tablets to her, but the nature of these medications remains unknown. Two has a son named Eleven Twelve, who frequently spies on his father in an attempt to uncover the purpose behind those medicines. Elsewhere, Michael attends a therapy session conducted by a psychiatrist named Seventy, along with his alter ego, Shadow Seventy. During the session, Michael opens up about the seagulls he saw in the desert, triggering memories of a childhood beach trip with his brother. However, the therapist fails to grasp the meaning of seagulls in the beach. Realizing that therapy won't be of any help, Michael abruptly stands up and leaves. Shortly after his departure, Two visits the therapist to inquire about Six's progress. Seventy reports that, as expected, Six shows resistance to therapy and remains preoccupied with thoughts of escaping the village. Later that day, Sixteen takes Michael to work as a sightseeing bus driver. Michael is nervous as he hasn't driven a bus in his life, but his brother is pretty sure that he can handle it. Michael takes the wheel and provides a guided tour of the village to the passengers, while Sixteen offers commentary on the various sites. Eventually, Michael drives the bus towards the desert, where they stumble upon an anchor partially buried in the sand. Michael assumes it is from a ship, suggesting the presence of an ocean near Nearby. However, Sixteen dismisses it as a desert illusion and leads Michael to an abandoned train station, triggering memories of their childhood playtime there. They refer to the place as the edge of the world, which strikes a chord with Michael. At that moment, a passenger approaches them and shares her experience of hearing the sound of the ocean during her initial visit. The next day, Michael takes number 313 to the ruins and expresses a peculiar connection to the location. Trusting his instincts, he discovers an old box containing a childhood note he had written. 313 regards it as evidence of the village's reality, but Michael remains skeptical, considering that it might be a trick. Later that night, he has a vision of his time in New York City, where he encounters a woman named Lucy. In the vision, Lucy approaches him to borrow his phone, and as they chat, Michael invites her to his place. While exchanging personal information, Michael reveals that he used to work as an analyst for a company called Sumacore, but resigned after noticing unusual changes in people. Here, we learn that Sumacore is experiencing experimenting with their new creation, a simulation village where people who are suffering from problems can live a peaceful and happy life. Upon hearing this, Lucy discloses that she also works for Sumacore and informs him that the company still has control over him. On another sunny day in the village, the tour bus makes a stop at Two's mansion. Unexpectedly, both Two and his son board the bus, making an announcement that a lucky family will be awarded a holiday trip to Escape Resort. The winner happens to be Sixteen. As a result, Sixteen, along with his family, including Michael, embark on the journey towards Escape Resort the following day. During the drive, Michael's gaze fixates on the towers, so he steers the bus in that direction. Suddenly, he experiences a jarring vision of the ocean, as well as two seated behind on the bus. After a brief moment, Michael snaps back to reality. With a confused mind, he apologizes to Sixteen for the way he's been acting, and reluctantly accepts him as his brother. However, upon reaching a Escape Resort, Sixteen reveals that he was forced into lying and that they're not brothers. He admits to being unsure of what Two wants from Six, but it might relate to the so-called Another World. Having shared this revelation, Sixteen becomes fearful of the consequences, but Michael reassures him that they'll soon find a means to escape the village. After their trip, Michael, Sixteen, and the passenger from earlier venture out in search of the ocean. After walking for some time, they eventually come across its majestic presence. In a moment of elation, Sixteen rushes into the water. Michael tries to stop him, but it proves too late as a glowing rover attacks, causing Sixteen to drown. This incident triggers a sense of panic within Michael, prompting him to return to Sixteen's home and deliver the devastating news of his demise. However, to Michael's bewilderment, the family appears unaffected by the tragedy. Unable to comprehend the situation, Michael begins to experience a mental breakdown. In the next scene, Michael once again finds himself flying in the desert, and this time he is approached by a guy named 909, who leads him back to two. The latter introduces 909 as an undercover agent and proposes that Michael 
Michael collaborate with him to spy on other covert cells within the village. This way, Michael can reach other fellow dreamers, those who can still retain memories of the outside world. Although skeptical of it being another trap, Michael recognizes the potential benefits for himself and agrees to the proposition. Their first assignment involves monitoring a school teacher named 1955, who is suspected of being a dreamer. To carry out their task, Michael poses as a teacher and keeps a watchful eye on the classroom. Seizing the opportunity, he encourages his students to investigate and gather information about what's really happening in the village. Eventually, Michael learns that the man he knows as two is only the latest in a series of twos, and that there is no one, nor has there ever been. As the days pass, Michael uncovers the fact that all the villagers are spying on each other. He even discovers that 909 is monitoring his activities and reporting back to two. As a result, Michael also begins to leverage his undercover role in an unusual way for his own advantage. One night, while spying on 1995 at his residence, the situation takes a horrifying turn as 1995 notices their presence and proceeds to harm himself with a blade. Witnessing this shocking act, Michael freaks out and promptly rushes 1995 to the hospital. After some time, 1995 regains consciousness and finds Michael by his side. Our protagonist inquires about the motive behind the self-inflicted harm and whether he fears anyone, but 1995 doesn't reply to anything. Meanwhile, 313 begins to sketch depictions of the outside world. One day, Michael meets up with her and asks if she possesses any knowledge regarding the outside world. However, she remains reluctant to disclose anything to him. Furthermore, she realizes that she should maintain distance from Michael, as she believes that those who become close to him tend to meet unfortunate fates. Left with no alternative, Michael secretly starts observing and monitoring her activities to ensure her safety. Unfortunately, this secrecy is short-lived, as an anonymous individual sends her photographs of Michael spying on her. This breaks her heart, as she didn't expect such activity from him. But little does she know that she is one of the targets, whose life is in danger. The scene then cuts to Two's mansion, where he administers his wife with a different medication, surprisingly reviving her from her coma. The couple engages in a brief conversation about the duration of her coma and about their son. Not long after, Two once again renders his wife unconscious with a spiked glass of wine. Later that night, their son, 1112, covertly enters a bar to rendezvous with 909. Here, it's revealed that 1112 is, in fact, homosexual, and the two of them are having a secret affair. Unbeknownst to them, Michael discreetly observes their encounter from a distance. The next day, Two assigns Michael a new mission to monitor 909, as his recent behavior has raised suspicions and casts him as a potential suspect. Subsequently, Michael visits 909's place and discovers that 1112 is present there as well. He confronts them, questioning whether they were the ones who sent the spying pictures to 313. When the pair hesitates to answer, Michael resorts to blackmail, forcing them to keep 313 out of all of this, or else he'll expose their secret relationship. However, Michael remains oblivious to the fact that 313 is already held captive in a dark tunnel alongside other dreamers. Later, 1112, who fears being exposed, brutally kills 909 by stabbing him, and not the way he typically does. Shortly after learning of 313's abduction, Michael swiftly rushes to her aid, heading towards the tunnel where people are treated or engulfed by a radiant rover. Within the tunnel, he comes across a young girl named 1100, who assists him in locating 313. It's then revealed that 1100 is one of the students from the village school who had been spying on both 6 and 2. This is why she had also been locked up here. But luckily, the trio successfully navigates their way out of the tunnel. The scene then flashes back to the past, where Michael is conversing with Lucy. During their discussion, Lucy reveals that the people Michael observed undergoing unusual changes are the ones being transported to the village world. She further asserts that Michael himself is on the brink of experiencing the same fate of offended by her words. Michael asks her to leave him alone. Before departing, Lucy writes her contact number on his table, urging him to reach out if he ever needs assistance. After some contemplation, Michael realizes that Lucy is the only person who can offer him help, prompting him to make a call. Surprisingly, her phone rings just outside his door. Upon checking, he discovers Lucy lying unconscious on the floor. He then helps her to get up and takes her back to his room. As she regains consciousness, the two end up getting sexy time for real. 
Back at the present, Michael awakens in his house only to discover a news announcement regarding his appointment with the Modern Love Bureau, where he will be matched with an ideal soulmate. Additionally, he finds an appointment card placed outside his door. Curious, Michael visits the Bureau, where he is paired with a blind woman, labeled as 415, who exactly resembles Lucy. His soulmate is blind, hard not to be offended by that. Following this arrangement, the new pair meet at a restaurant to get to know each other better. Michael knows that she is Lucy, but 415 has no recollection of life outside the village. Nevertheless, she appears to enjoy Michael's company in their first meeting. After conversing for a while, Michael invites her to his place, the same way as he had done in the past. At home, as they're about to share a kiss, Michael suddenly experiences a vision of their past intimacy, which unsettles him. In response, he inadvertently refers to her as Lucy, causing her to get angry and abruptly leave. Elsewhere, 1112 steals three differently colored medications from his father's safe and brings them to 313, asking her help in determining their purpose. After conducting an examination, 313 reveals that one of the pills is a sleeping tablet, while the contents of the other two remain unknown, probably for headaches and also boners. At the driver 147's residence, Michael enjoys a drink with the family. Shortly after, they discover discover a deep, dark hole in their garden. Uncertain about its nature, 147 quickly reports it to the relevant authorities. In the midst of their concern, 147's young daughter cycles towards the hole and tragically falls into it. Wondering if two can help, Michael rushes to inform him of the devastating incident. However, two dismisses the hole as a mere anomaly due to weather conditions. It becomes evident that mysterious, similar holes have appeared in other parts of the village as well. As a measure to address this issue, pigs are distributed to residents, as their breath is believed to stabilize the atmosphere. Okay, that was, that was the moment. I don't know what the hell's going on in this show. Whole sniffing pigs? What? Later, Michael and 415 are brought to the clinic, where 313 is instructed to proceed with the process of genetic manipulation. 313 is hesitant as she has feelings for Michael, but she is forced to comply, because two can punish her for being a dreamer. Here, it is revealed that new couples are formed via gene alteration, initially making them fall for each other. The scene then cuts to a wedding ceremony of Michael and 415. In an attempt to prevent the marriage from taking place, 313 approaches Michael and kisses him in front of everyone. This act shatters 415's heart, leading her to flee from the wedding venue. Michael follows her to console her, and during this, it suddenly dawns on him that 415 was simply pretending to be blind. No way she heard the kiss. Enraged, he presses her to reveal her true identity, and the latter finally confesses that she is Lucy. It turns out that Lucy Lucy is aware about the ongoing connection between the real as well as the village world. She further reveals that two brought her to the village for only one mission. She had to fall in love with Michael and then break his heart. However, she now expresses relief that he has been freed from her manipulations. Devastated by this revelation, Michael leaves the venue and walks back home. Along the way, he notices 147 standing near the mysterious hole, contemplating jumping into it in search of his daughter. Worried, Michael approaches the poor man and urges him to remain strong for his his wife, even though their daughter is no longer with them. He then pulls 147 away from the hole and offers a comforting hug. Moments later, Lucy suddenly appears from behind and plunges into the mysterious hole. Filled with grief, Michael screams at the gates of Two's residence, vowing to seek revenge for 415's death. Across the street, another man bearing a striking resemblance to Michael observes him closely. That night, 313 awakens from a nightmare, only to find Six sitting on her bed. He questions her about why she kissed him at the church, and she confesses that she couldn't resist the impulse. Six then proceeds to kiss her, but she is overwhelmed by more visions, causing her to abruptly stop. The very next day, Michael visits 313 at the clinic and expresses his sorrow over the loss of 415. This puzzles 313, as she wonders why he didn't seem concerned about 415 the previous night. Confused, Michael denies having been at 313's place the night before. He then approaches 147, but the latter also walks away from him, stating he doesn't want to fight him again. Confused and worried, Michael returns home, only to find his place in disarray. These events intensify his stress as he struggles to comprehend the unfolding situation. Later on, Michael attempts to speak with 147, but at the same time he notices his doppelganger and gives chase. Six successfully apprehends the duplicate within a building, where they engage in a brawl. Here, we learn that the duplicate Kit calls himself 2 by 6 <laughs> A vengeful version of Six, who has a sole mission of killing two and being named after a 
piece of wood. Despite our protagonist also disliking Teal, he stops his double from committing the crime. He says that they will have to act calmly or else trouble will come. Meanwhile, there is also a duplicate of two wandering within the village, labeling himself as the Unto or the Numberless, who has a different purpose. This is becoming some Kingdom Hearts ass shit. Shortly after, 147 finds Unto and brings him to his home to protect him from detection as a numberless wanderer. However, 147 can't hide him for long as the dogs looking for the impersonator arrive and chase Unto away. Elsewhere, 1112 administers a medication to his mother and finally awakens her. This is the first time he spends quality time alone with her. During their conversation, 1112 inquires whether he can go to the other place. In response, his mother reveals that it's not possible for the ones born in the village to leave. Although initially saddened by this revelation, 1112 somehow manages to calm himself down, realizing there is no solution. He then gently puts his mother back to sleep. Meanwhile, 313 continues to be plagued by unsettling visions. Overwhelmed, she flees her apartment and eventually finds herself in the heart of the desert. There, she discovers a glass door adorned with the Sumacore logo. Intrigued, she enters and is astounded to discover that it serves as a portal to another world. In the real world, Michael goes back to the Sumacore building and makes his way to a specific floor. Upon entering, he gazes through a window and is stunned to spot Six in the village. Desperate to grab Six's attention, he pounds on the window, but his efforts prove futile. It turns out that the Sumacore building is none other than the tower that is seen from the village. Just then, an approaching woman informs him that his car is ready to take him to his appointment with Mr. Curtis. The village is experiencing an expansion as an increasing number of newcomers arrive. Unlike Six, these newcomers believe they are coming from the village rather than from another world. Meanwhile, Six experiences intensifying pain within his body and discovers that he is slowly dying. He currently finds himself at the cemetery, where he meets 1112, placing flowers on the grave of 909. Six proposes that they work together to escape the village. However, the young boy expresses no desire to leave the village. In the real world, Michael is escorted to Mr. Curtis's car, where we recognize the driver as 147 from the village. Upon arriving at their destination, Michael meets Mr. Curtis and his wife Helen, who are none other than two and his wife from the village. It's all coming together now. Wait, no, no it's not. Mr. Curtis explains that the village is an experiment taking place within Helen's mind and that she has sacrificed herself so that broken people can have better lives. Following this, he takes Michael into the city, showing him the positive impact the village has had on people suffering from various diseases. In an unexpected turn of events, 1112, who feels like a prisoner within the village, enters his parents' bedroom and suffocates his mother to death before committing the unthinkable. Later that day, two returns home and is heartbroken to discover the lifeless bodies of his wife and son. As a consequence of this event, the village begins to experience a surge in mysterious holes that threaten to engulf its inhabitants. The following day, the villagers assemble for the funeral of 1112. Six also attends, and miraculously, his sickness has disappeared. Six implores two to release the villagers before they fall victim to the destructive holes tearing the village apart. In response, two unveils a version of the truth, acknowledging that they're all prisoners. He reveals that the only means to close the holes is for a dreamer to take his wife's place. Hearing this, 313 decides to sacrifice herself to save the other people. She steps forward and takes the three different colored pills provided by Tsu. In addition to this, Tsu delegates the responsibility of the village to Six, appointing him as number one. With this, he places a grenade in his mouth holy shit, and commits the unthinkable. That's one way to do it, you savage you. In the real world, Mr. Curtis introduces Michael to Sarah, who is the real-life counterpart of 313 from the village. Sarah is in a state of near delusion, grappling with the aftermath of childhood abuse. As 313 consumes the pills in the village, Sarah collapses in the real world, prompting Michael to offer his assistance. In the final scene, we see Michael, who assumes his position as the new head of Sumacor. Meanwhile, Six and a sedated 313 sit together in the desert of the village. Six vows to transform the village into a place of goodness and promise, while 313 sheds a drop of tear from her eyes. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.